Thank you so, so much. And uh, welcome to all of you this evening. And thank you for joining us as we all examine the word of life. Jesus told his disciples, why don't you join the crowd since they have already left? Peter replied, to whom shall we go? You have the word of life. Let us pray. Father God, we know that you have the word of life. That's why we have all gathered here this moment to study your word. We pray that you, that you will take the truth that the Holy Spirit will bring to us this hour and make it a source of blessing and equally a source of challenge to all of us. I pray that you will cause me to bring your word to your people for your glory and for the edification of all of us. This is my prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Guess what? We're just going to finish chapter 11 of the great book of the heroes of faith, chapter 11 of Hebrews. So we've been working on this for a while, and uh, tonight we will finish the finish chapter 11. And uh, we are going, only we have, we'll be having two chapters left after tonight. That will be chapter 12 and 13. Well loaded. The, the more I study the book of Hebrews, the more <laughs> excited I get. And the more it becomes one of my favorite books of the Bible, the book of Hebrews. Very loaded, powerfully written under the mentorship of the Holy Spirit to the church, not to unbelievers. The book of Hebrews was addressed to those who were born again, those who were having difficult time during the first century Christianity, those who many of them have already bailed out, have fallen on the, on the wayside, have uh, backslided as, the, as many churches will use the word backs. Backslide. The book of Hebrews, chapter 11. Turn with me there and let us read the remaining portion of this chapter. The Heroes of Faith, part 7. If you're looking for a subtitle, Other Saints of Faith, Other Saints of Faith, Hebrews 11, 32 through verse 40. If you have your Bible with you, turn with me. If you, so we can read together. And what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. From weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign, foreign armies to fight, to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection, and others we are tortured, not accepting their release in order that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and scourgings, yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were put to death with the sword. They went about in Sheepskins in ghost skins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, 
men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. And all this, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised because God had provided something better for us so that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. Apart from us, they should not be made perfect. That's interesting. Apart from us, who are you? Who are we? Apart from us, all these things would not have been made perfect. All the, all the sins of the Old Testament would not have been made perfect. Apart from you. It didn't say apart from Jesus Christ. Underscore that. Apart from us. Us includes the author of this book and the entire word of Christendom. Apart from us. They should not be made perfect. Perfect means complete. Complete. Tileo in the original means complete. It doesn't mean perfect in the sense of sinless. Rather, complete. You are an important, I've said it so many times, you and I, we are an important link in the plan of God. The eyes of the angelic beings, both fallen and elect have converged on the church. All eyes are on you. They are all looking down. Those in heaven, those underneath are all looking down because you are an important plan. You are an important plan, part, integral part of the plan of God. The angels are watching us. They are looking constantly. You are, you are, we are all in a theater, if you would. And we are the epicenter of the drama. There's ongoing drama right now, right now. And the entire angelic beings are curious. And they are watching us closely. Every move you make, every action you take, every word you utter, very significant in the angelic arena. As Paul tells us in, 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 in First Corinthians regarding the spectator, that we are spectator, the angels taking so much interest regarding us. And Peter tells us, that the angels scoop, they stoop down to see what the church is all about. It was hidden. Just think about it. The church was not something made plain in the Old Testament. The Old Testament believers were not looking forward to the church because they didn't know anything about the church. Nobody knew that a church will come. In the Old Testament, Oh, they, they, it's like a, uh, two mountain peaks, two mountain peaks. You're standing on one mountain peak and you are looking on, across the other mountain peak. Oh, they saw, they saw the first advent, they saw Jesus Christ, they saw that there will be an advent for, for redemption. And then the next thing they saw was, millenn was a millennial reign of Christ. Boom, the new age. Of the, they didn't see anything in between. In the valley was hidden the church. And that's you. God hid it from the eyes of the Old Testament prophets. And they had a glimpse of something, but they didn't know what it was. It was, it was, a it was kind of a negative. You see, when you take a picture, when you take a picture, and then in your picture, uh, not, not now, now we have all these uh, electronics, or we have all these uh, digitals. In the, in the uh, many, many years ago, that five millimeter camera, do you, can you still remember that? That 35 
what do you that five uh, that role you put you put it and then you take pictures and after you have completed the role you get it out to be developed you you pull it out you put that role when you pull it you see some kind of shadow you see people you know this, this you took these pictures you just see maybe group of five people but you can make up who is who they are there when it, when they are developed then you see you say whoa that's my uncle that's my sister that's my friend that's that's me in the middle it's so clear after it is developed that was how the church the church they just saw a glimpse and once they saw this glimpse they started itching they started wanting to be part of it jesus christ told the disciples that the prophets of the old wanted to be part of this age they wanted they craved so much to be born in this dispensation they knew it was something unique something dynamic not knowing that they will not that they will be cut off and you you and i will be part of the church we we are living in the greatest time of human history you pinch yourself pinch yourself if you are still alive if you feel it that means you are still alive you are an integral part of the plan of god that he has crafted for the church the church is unique it's called the bride the bride and our lord jesus christ is the bridegroom no other uh, group or no other body of the saints was ever called bride by the church and so we have entered into an important arena an important age and so it says because god had provided something better for us us christians so that apart from us they should not be made perfect we are a link special link i don't care regardless of what we are going through in life regardless of your state regardless of your condition whether you are rich or poor doesn't matter you are an integral part of this plan that god is unfolding each day god's plan is unfolding and as he as he unfolds his plan he's unfolding you equally he's unfolding you this is a, a grand plan that one day we meet the ultimate plan that god himself designed and so the author in challenging this hebrew believers those who are not growing up he, he, he in essence is telling them in chapter 5 where we saw grow up grow up it's been a long time since since you've become a believer grow up you cannot realize the full potential of the plan of god for your life until you have grown god can use you to the ultimate to the maximum until you have matured and that's why paul tells us in second timothy 3:16 and 17 see what paul tells timothy and the church he said all scripture genesis to revelation all scripture is god breathed in other words god breathed his word to the human authors he just breathed through them hmm. he breathed through them everything they didn't have their own uh, word the word of god is not man man word is god's word that's what it say it is not your ordinary word it is the very word of god he breathed through them so that's what paul said all scriptures god breathed it is profitable for doctrine which is exactly what i'm doing here it is profitable for doctrine doctrine doesn't mean one particular verse doctrine means a a realm a realm of the word of god abstract from different passages and contexts and you build biblical teaching called doctrine so paul says all scripture 
is God read. It is profitable for doctrine, for teaching of the word of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof. The word of God is designed to reprove us. For reproof, it is designed to reprove us. It reproof, it, it, the word of God reproves me when I'm studying. I see, I say, yep, Moses, the word is talking to you right here. It reproves me before it reproves you through my mouth. Now, before I bring this word to you, the Holy Spirit and I have already gone through my own portion. And so we nobody's exempted. Yeah. Even the, the the those people you think are the, the giants in the arena, spiritual arena, no one is exempted from the reproof, from the tutorial power of the word of God. So Paul says it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. The word of God is, is designed to correct us. If you are a person who doesn't accept correction, you can never go any further in your life. If you're a person who, when, it, when you are corrected, you get upset, you get, you get, say, don't correct me. My way is the only way. Is I don't need any other way. That's my way. Well, your way is a way to hell. You can't go any further with, with that correction. So the Bible is there for, to correct us. We all have different teachings, different beliefs, some of them are not correct. Some of them have correct, half truth, half truth, and half correct equals wrong teaching. It's, 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 so when the truth is taught, the Holy Spirit opens your eyes to the truth, you are corrected. So Paul says it is profitable not only for reproof, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, but for instruction, which is exactly what I'm doing here, instructing us as a coach. See yourself as a player and Moses as a coach. I'm just a coach. That's all. I'm not doing anything. Just coach of taking what I have learned. I spend hours learning this as a coach. Then I bring it to you and show you how to handle jungle, how to juggle the ball, how to throw it so that it doesn't fall, how to, that's a coach. That's what I'm doing. Paul says it is profitable for instruction instruction in righteousness. And then he comes in the same verse, he zooms in, he tells us, for instruction in righteousness, he tells us the purpose, that a man of God, that a woman of God, that's the purpose clause, might be matured. That's the key. That is the key of biblical teaching. That is the key of Bible class. That is the key of your, the note you are taking. That a child of God, a woman of God, a man of God might be matured. Why? Paul tells us, and furnished unto all good works. See, God uses prepared vessels. God uses people who are prepared, those who will not fumble the ball in the arena of spiritual battlefield. So that Satan doesn't laugh at God and his plan. So that's the reason why what we're doing is so crucial, so important. So Paul, uh, the author tells them, mature, grow, go, go. In chapter six, remember back in chapter six, he tells them in verse one, therefore living the elementary teaching about the Christ. Living the elementary teaching about the Christ. There are many people, they just stay on diaper. Stay on diaper as Christians for years. I mean, Christian diapers, not like babies in the kindergarten, or not only kindergarten in the nursery room. There are many Christians today, they have never grown up. They've been believers for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. They cannot handle, not even one iota of pressure when it comes. As we learn from Proverbs 24 verse 10, if you falter in the time of distress, your strength is too small. That means you don't have capacity to handle pressure. The only thing that can determine whether we are growing or not growing is distress. How do you, how do you measure the strength of something? You use weight. The only way God knows whether we are growing or determines how 
power we are growing is by applying pressure to our to our lives. And uh, if small pressure like a mosquito charge comes to you and you fall flat like a, you have been hit by a, a rock gate, and that means you're not growing. And so the author tells them, grow up. It, the same thing Paul tells the Corinthians, grow up. And the same time I'm telling all of us, let us keep growing. In verse one again of chapter six, Hebrews, dear for living the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity. You see, let us press on to maturity. Stop mingling in baby formula, baby food. Baby, there, there comes a time when you don't know, when we no longer need baby food. Baby, even though they taste good, they, those baby baby milk or those uh, I remember back home, uh, similac. You, you there's, there's a milk you call similac. You take it even though you are grown up. Every time you know they don't belong. It doesn't belong to you for your for your younger nephew niece. You go and you dip a spoonful and you put it in your mouth. It, it, it tastes so good. It, it's not your food. It doesn't gonna take you anywhere. It's not gonna fill you up. And that's what many Christians do. We just stay in similar, like in formula. We mingle in day and night, and we never grow up. We never come to the potential that God has set for us. Shall we advance to the high ground? Of spiritual maturity. And so the author in verse 32 now zooms in and after he had given them lists beginning uh, back where we started, he tells us without, without uh, faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, we cannot please God. And then he, he begins to give us the list of heroes of faith. He began with Abel and moved to Enoch whom God took alive. God took him alive, he never saw death. And, and continues down the line. And then he comes to Abraham, the father of faith. Abraham was just ordinary person like us. And then he, he, he continues moving from Abraham and then uh, down to the list of Moses, to the list of uh, Joseph and the rest of people whom the Lord demonstrated who put forth a banner of faith that the world can see. And so today, he now comes to the conclusion of this great teaching in this chapter. And how did he conclude this? He said, and what more shall I say? It's like, it's like what else is left for me to say? I've given you all this list. Even if I stop here, that would have been enough for me to have shaken all of you who are listening to me. But he didn't stop there. In his conclusion, he said, what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, and Samuel, and the prophets. Pause here. He, 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 somehow, he knew that he hadn't, there were still great men, giants men of faith that he left out in his list. And if he took time to tell them of every of these individuals he mentioned, there will be more chapters written just under the heroes of the faith. And so he just mentioned them in passing. The, the recipients, they knew about these people mentioned. You and I, uh, may not know all these people mentioned. For, for example, Barak. If I ask you who is Barak, I'm, so, I'm sure many of us will be scratching our head. Barak, Barak, have I heard that name Barak? Where did that, I heard the name Barak? Maybe you've heard the name Barak. What if I say Jephthah? Have you heard the name Jephthah? Who is Jephthah? To, the, to those who received this new, they were all Jewish believers. They understood these people. But for us, we have to go back to the scripture to dig them out, to know who, they, who these people, uh, this reference that uh, were, to whom was the author referring to. 
And so it's so important that we look into these people, but we're not gonna look, since the author didn't devote time, he, the author has already made his point. I'm not gonna devote time taking one and tearing them either. He has already made his point. And when he says, and what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon. We know about Gideon. Gideon, God called Gideon. Gideon was just in the trash, uh, trash uh, wheat where he was uh, getting wheat ready. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him. We know the story of this Gideon. He began by with doubt. He began with, uh, if, if, you, if it's really you, I want tomorrow morning when I wake up, let this place be dry and this place be wet. And he went to bed. Wake up, exactly what he demanded. He was dry, he was wet. Maybe coincidence. Something happened, I didn't know what, if it's really you, let this be revised, let this place. And, and he went to bed, came back, the same way, he knew this was God talking to him and he took that challenge. He failed. He began with weak weakness and failed. And, and, and all this, the most important thing here in verse 32, mark this because it's gonna be part of my points when, when, I, when I give us the closing point. Mark this verse 32. All these names mentioned, all of them, six of them, all these six names mentioned, all of them had some kind of failure. At least the, the first four of them had some kind of failures associated with them, or even five of them. In other words, they didn't, they have, it wasn't a shining fate. It wasn't. Uh, everything was so good of these people. They never failed in their life. They just shine from the beginning to the end. Mark, mark, the reason why I say mark them, mark those people, is that God can still use us even when we fail. Our failure does not tamper with the program and the plan that God has for us. When we fail and recognize our, and recognize our failure, and do the necessary thing that the Bible has demanded. And that is restoration to fellowship through acknowledgement of our sins before God. God can go, still go on and use us to accomplish the purpose he has for our lives. And we can still make it in the hall of faith. We can still make it in the hall of faith. These people, they had their own sp small sp leopard spots, if you would. Leopard. There's always spots, no matter wherever you see a leopard. They had their own leopard spots, and yet God went on to put them, to classify them among those who made the list of the heroes of the faith. And so Gideon failed, God used him. Barak, Barak was one of the judges that God used, one of the, those people God used during the time uh, of the judges to deliver Israel. But judge Barak didn't want to go. He was a long time until a woman, Deborah. Deborah was the one who encouraged. See, women are also very vital in the plan of God. Don't think because you didn't, you don't hear so much women mentioned in the Bible. No, they are vital link and plan of God. Every person is important in God's program. Nobody's left, ever left out. Deborah. Deborah encouraged Barak, and Barak charged and moved by faith, and they had victory. What about Samson? <laughs> we know the story of Samson, a man God endowed with power, a man who applied faith over and over, even a man who dealt with lion, a man who by faith conquered nation, Philistines, dealt with them by the thousands. Just one woman. One lady, one small blind lady, tiny bit lady, I don't know, called Delana. That lady 
brought this powerful man down. You would think that that's the end of his story. Yet, he still, his name still appeared here. We don't know God, do we? In our own book, these people that I mentioned would have been erased completely and totally. And the list, go, the list continues down, not, not only to uh, Samson, Jephthah. Jephthah also made his own uh, error. When you, when, you, when you look, when you go to uh, Judges 14.6, you will see uh, something about Jephthah. Uh, again, he made, uh, he made uh, some kind of crooked uh, vow and he reluctantly fulfilled that vow as well. What about David? Oh, David is notorious. His failure, uh, there is no anybody that doesn't, you mentioned the name David, everybody knows that name. And everybody knows the failure of this great man of God. You would think that those failure would have erased him from God's program. How much, let alone bringing the Messiah, the righteous one, through his line. If I were God at that time, I would say, David, so sorry. I'm just erasing you. Are you watching me? I just erased your name right here. Next time, don't learn, learn not to fail. There's no way I can bring my son through you. No. It was not only for God to show us how, how merciful, how compassionate he is when we fail and recovers, when we recover from our failure, God goes on to fulfill the plan he has for us. David failed, but he recovered. Psalm 51 is just an outpouring of his recovery, creating me a new heart. Wash me with his soap. That was David pouring out. He didn't, he didn't, he was shot when he failed God. They created in me a new heart. And that was just his yearning for restoration to fellowship. But God still brought the Son of God through his line. That's an amazing God we have. And that's the amazing God that I'm, I'm, I'm talking about tonight. And so these this people, David and Samuel, and he didn't just stop. He could, he could have stopped with these names. He added prophets. So there were many, many prophets who made a cut, but he didn't list them. Who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shot the mass of lions. Shot the mass of lions we can identify with even David. We can identify with something. We can identify definitely with Daniel, who by faith shut the mouth of hungry lions. These people, they were men of faith. They conquered. David went in front of Goliath and said, who are you? A giant, maybe three times his height. Or more than that. Small David, small statue. And David stood before him and said, Who are you? Who are you? Who are you that you are taunting the God of Israel? The battle is the Lord. And he took just small stone, small stone, and took his, put a little stone and said, And this man was laughing at him and said, What, are you, what do you think you are doing? <laughs> And you think I'm a, I'm a, I'm a bird? You want to kill a bird, a dove, with a sling? <laughs> That's a joke. Boy, go call your father before I cut your neck off. Go call your dad. And David, zoom, 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 and he let it go. God took it from there and knocked this giant down. The battle was over. Just as he said, the battle is the Lord's. That's the work of faith. When you, in your own life, you see giants standing before you, first of all, recognize that it is not you, 
fighting this giant. You can't fight this giant. It is God who will fight the giant for you. If you recognize that, then you can say the battle belongs to the Lord. And then you go and sleep, apply faith, and let God work for you. And that was David, a great man of faith. But they conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shot the mouth of lion, conquered the power of fire, and that would be Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and many others. Escaped the age of the sword. Many ran away when they were confronted. From weaknesses, from weakness, we are made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to fight, to flight. Simple faith, an act of faith. Then Gideon only took 300 men, not 3,000, not even, not, uh, you would think maybe uh, something like 10,000 would do it. Nope, 300 men to fight a gazillion. They were numbered in every sense, by chariots, by any means. And yet then uh, Gideon handed them defeat. Not Gideon, but God who fought through them. Women receive back their dead by resurrection. When you, two, two women will come to mind when you hear women receive their dead by resurrection. Resurrection here shouldn't be resurrection. That word should better be understood as, as resuscitation, resuscitation, resuscitation rather than resurrection. There's only one resurrection in the Bible. That's the, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. No one has ever been resurrected. The next resurrection is, will be the resurrection of the church. And so resuscitation, the, the, the woman who served Elijah, the widow, the, no, the, woman who, sorry, the woman who served Elijah, the son died. Elijah, the woman of Sarephet, the son died. Elijah had to bring him back. just by faith. Then the, the list continues, and others experience mockings and scourges, yes, also chains and imprisonment. Chains and imprisonment. What more can we say? These people, they suffered tremendously. They suffered tremendously. They, they were stoned. They were sewn into. A good traditional source told us that Isaiah, Isaiah, prophet Isaiah was cut in half. A giant, one of the great prophets of the Old Testament was sawn in half, alive. Wow. And others experience mockings and scourgings for 36 years, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. That was capital punishment in the time of Israel. They were sown in two. They were tempted. Tempted. They were put to death with the sword. They went about in slip sheepskins, in goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated. Pause for a moment. We always think that the children of God, they should be the well taken care of people. The children of God, they should have the best in life. Not so fast. Look at the heroes of the faith that we have been we are listed here. Those who have caught this list. They were destitute. Many of them were destitute. They were not recognized in the public. They were not recognized in the society. They were ordinary people. Walking in the street, not good clothing, some rags, sheep, 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 sheep skins, like John the Baptist. He didn't, he didn't come out to preach with suit and tie. He was just ordinary person, ordinary person, doesn't look invited. You, and when he's finished 
preaching, you wouldn't like to invite him to come to your palace to eat or eat dinner with you because he doesn't look inviting to your house, doesn't dress properly. But in the eyes of men, these people were nobody. But in the eyes of God, they were precious. They were pearls. They were jewels. They were gold. Don't let the world dictate who you are in Christ. Don't let the world standard be a measuring measuring uh, yard for you as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't let what you see from the outside to be something you, you can use to measure yourself to see if you are doing well. If you do so, you will fail again and again. It's so important to read this and look at ourselves. Being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, ill-treated. Christians never receive good treatment. It has never happened. I have never seen Christians receiving we're coming, come, come here. You Christians, you are, re, have a seat, the, the, relax. Go to the beach and take a sunshine. Nope. Jesus said, if they hated me, they will hate you equally. If you are a Christian and the world doesn't hate you, I may want to check the type of Christian you are. If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and the world doesn't, the world, I'm talking about unbelievers, they just love every bit about you. You better check your engine oil to make sure it's not dried up. Because if you are full of engine oil, the Holy Spirit living in, by the Spirit, I can assure you of one thing, you will be persecuted. Paul said those who want to be righteous, they will be persecuted. No exception. That's one, that's one way to determine whether you are really living the spiritual life. If you are living the spiritual life and you are among unbelievers, they will be uncomfortable. Every time you come in, they will be uncomfortable. If they are doing something and you come in, they stop. If they are saying things that are not proper and once you enter into the room, the topic is changed. They will be uncomfortable. If they're saying something and you come in and you, they keep saying something, that means your light is not shining yet. You have not identified yourself as a Christian, and that's that's too bad. And you are falling into that cycle. Jesus said, if you are ashamed of me here on earth, I will be ashamed of you when I return back into my kingdom. They were ill-treated men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. Everywhere was their home. Some lived in caves. David lives in caves for, for, for months, running for his life. But these were giants, great men of God. When I, read, when I, when I was reading this, I... One of the great scholars, Leon Morris, in his commentary on Hebrews, he made a, a statement here. He said, to all outward appearance, quote him, to all outward appearance, these people of faith were insignificant and unimportant. Then he goes on to say, the despised and ill-treated group of servants of God was of greater real world than all the rest of humanity put together. You got that? You are of great worth than the entire human race put together. Before God, you are priceless. Go to bed with that. You are priceless. And so he continues to tell us in verse 39, and all of this having gained approval through their faith. See, what brought them, what, what gave them this approval, made them call these uh, heroes of the faith? Nothing but faith. And guess what? We have that in common with them. Faith. 
fit. They didn't have something special and then we have something special. No, the common denominator we have with them, faith. They gain approval through their faith. Did not receive what was promised. You see, for them, God promised them something and they were looking forward to this. And yet they applied faith. They didn't receive it. When he says to what God promised them, the Holy Spirit didn't tell us exactly what that promise here referred to. But it's, I, I, the, the, the channel for this promise, of course, is through Jesus Christ. The channel by which this promise was realized or would be realized to the full, fullest measure is Jesus Christ. So God promised them. He promised them a savior, of course. They didn't see this savior. Back in Genesis 3.15, a savior was promised. Abraham didn't see the Savior. Adam and Eve didn't see the Savior. In fact, they thought they, they had born the Savior, and that's when they named their son Cain. When Cain acted evil, they said no. The promise of Genesis 3.15 is all about good. It can be evil. So they were, everyone was looking forward to that promise, the fulfillment, and yet they applied faith. But the author now takes a deep breath. He takes a deep breath. In verse 40, he says, because God had provided something better for us. Underscore that. God, the creator of the universe, the very one who sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross, the Bible says here, he has provided something better for you. What, what else are you looking for? What else could be better than what God himself provided and the Holy Spirit calls it better? Better than what the Old Testament believers had. Better than what the old saints experienced. Better. You want me to yell? You want me to scream? How scream? How loud do you want me to scream? You have better than what Moses had, than what Abraham had, than what David had, than what Hezekiah had, than what Jeremiah had, than what Isaiah had. You had, you have better thing than they did. You are more equipped than they were. You and I, when I say you, it's just because I'm a teacher. But when I say you, I'm also saying myself. You and I, we are more equipped. We have better, better plan. Remember, Hebrews tells them that the old plan has been set aside, has been suspended. The law and all the regulations, they have been set aside. And a new thing has come under the tutorial of Jesus Christ, under the dispensation of the church, we got a new thing working for us. Why do we want to look back to the Old Testament saints? Why do you want to be like Isaiah? Why do you want to be, why do you want to make David your hero? Why do you want to make Moses of the Old Testament your hero? When you and I can be greater than Moses and David, because we have more than David. We have more than they did. And so he tells us we have better, something better for us, so that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. You are a link. That, is, that through you, the plan of God comes to completion, comes to full realization comes to be completed. You are a link. Don't lose this opportunity God has given us. There's a saying in the, in the English expression, opportunity comes but once. Opportunity comes but once. In other words, every time an opportunity comes to you, you may get another opportunity, but it's never the same opportunity that came to you first. That opportunity that came to you, it may, came, it may come another one, but it's not going to be the same picture of opportunity that you once 
realized. Opportunity comes but once. In other words, when the opportunity comes to you, don't blow it. Don't say, well, I'll just pass on this one. Another one will come. It may never come. We have been given a privilege. You and I, a church, as church age believers, we have the greatest privilege in the program, in the plan of God, to execute God's plan. To, you, we have been given more. The Old Testament saints never had in the wedding of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Creator, the Triunion God, never, not in history, indwelt any creature until the Pentecost, after the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, the church be becomes something unique. When this church that we call church today, this gathering of believers, the body of Christ, wherever we gather, some gather in the Methodist church, some gather in the Baptist church, some gather in the Assemblies of God church, wherever we gather as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, the real church is you, it's me, not the building itself. The real church is us. We make up the body of Christ called the church. When, uh, when, when we are removed, there will never be anything like this in history for all eternity. Why then are we wasting our time chasing the wind? Going after things that will not last. Going after things that will not count for eternity. Why are we wasting our time? Why are we not making impact? in our time, in our day? Why are we not prepared to leave legacy in the sands of time when we, do, when we do call, when we are called home? Let's take these seven principles, these seven points of biblical truths and principles, and then we'll call it a close one. Some of them are lengthy, so I'll try my best to be slow. I've always been told that uh, you read it fast. <laughs> All right, one, here we go. The heroes of the faith were ordinary men and women who took God's word at its face value. I'll say it again. The heroes of the faith we are ordinary men and women who took God's word at its face value. Two. I come back again. I don't want to say he was fast today. I didn't get that one. Like I said, there were at least a few that, that are long, longer than others. One, the heroes of the faith We are ordinary men and women who took God's word at its face value. Number two, any believer can make it into the hall of faith. Any believer can make it into the hall of faith. Don't count yourself as, I am not a pastor. I'm not an evangelist. Uh, those are the giants. Nope. On the contrary, some evangelists, some pastors don't even cut any, any make any dent just because that, that's just a gift. A gift doesn't make a person great in the plan of God. You can have the gift of a pastor, a gift of evangelist that does not give you anything, not even a sand in God's program. It is your life, your application of the truth that you receive that will make a whole lot of difference in your spiritual life. And so anybody can be that giant, whether you be just ordinary person with no, you, people don't see you, people don't recognize you. And you can still be known in the plan of God. Number three, faith in God, faith in God perseveres, faith in God perseveres even when there seems to be Odds against believing. Faith in God perseveres even when there seems to be odds in believing. While we are writing, I will read Romans 4, verse 18 through 22. 
through 21 rather. Faith in God, I say it again, faith in God perse perseveres. He keeps believing. He doesn't give up. He perseveres even when there seems to be odds against believing. In other words, this thing doesn't look like something we walk. It doesn't look like something that we walk out. Nope, you don't go by sight. That's why it's called faith. Verse 18, in hope against hope. That's how Paul begins verse 18, in hope against hope. He believed, that is Abraham, in order that he might become a father of many nations according to that which had been spoken so shall your descendants be. That's all he heard. And with that becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body now as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. He was already praising God for something he hasn't seen yet. And being fully assured that what he had promised, being fully assured that what he had promised, that's important, he's able to perform. God cannot promise us something he cannot perform. Number five, rather number four, faith, though imperfect, faith, though imperfect, never ceases to please God. Faith, though imperfect, never ceases to please God. Even if that mustard seed faith, even if that faith is messed up somewhere along the line and you recover, like Gideon, like Barak, they, uh, they were weak faith, they were imperfect faith in standard, in measurement. But yet they pleased God and made it into the hall of faith. Faith, though imperfect, never ceases to please God. In other words, imperfect faith, imperfect, imperfect faith is better than unbelief. Unbelief is where you cross with God. Number five, the heroes of the faith, the heroes of the faith in their day did extraordinary with little resources. I'll say it again. The heroes of the faith in their day did extraordinary with little resources. Daniel did extraordinary with tiny bit the law, uh, things about the, uh, nothing much, little resources. His knowledge of this Jehovah God didn't have much. No indwelling of the Holy Spirit, no indwelling of the Son, no indwelling of the Father, well, little. Yet they did extraordinary. Number six, we, pause on this one, we, we the church, we the church age believers, we the church age believers have more resources than the Old Testament saints. Don't miss this one, so I'm going to go back again and repeat it. We, the church age believers, that's you and I, we, the church age believers, have more resources than the Old Testament saints. You say, what are those resources? We have the indwelling Holy Spirit, they didn't have. We have the indwelling Son, they didn't have. We have the indwelling of the Father, they didn't have. We have the completed canon of the scripture, Genesis to Revelation, they didn't have. Some of them only had one, one page. Some of them didn't even have any. Enoch didn't have any single page of the Bible. Abraham didn't have Bible to go with. And yet, Moses only had five books. In fact, before it took him time to write five books. And yet, these people, they honored God beyond measure. Their lives are still shining even after they were gone. We're still reading about them. When you are gone, can anybody mention your name in the pages of Christianity? Can anybody remember you? Can members of your church remember you when you are gone? 
as the revelation tells us, when the righteous lives, his deeds follow after him. When you depart, let's assume you depart tonight. What legacy will you leave in the sense of time? In the history of eternity? Reflect on this. Again, number six, we the church age believers have more resources than the Old Testament says. Finally, finally, if, if, even if you didn't get anything that I said in this point, get this one. To whom much is given, that's number seven. To whom much is given, much is what? Fill in the gap. To whom much is given, much is what? Fill in the gap. For those of you who don't know what it is, I know you do. Just a joke. To whom much is given, Jesus said it point blank, much is required. Prepare for next week as we enter into chapter 12. Because in chapter 12, these people, the author will put them, in forward, put them forward as witnesses. Those who will condemn us. Should we fail? Should we fail in any way of this great plan that God has for us? May God keep us plugging. May God keep us focused. May God keep us awake in this angelic conflict. May God continue to encourage you and I that we don't look backward, that we don't look to the left or to the right, but to the front where Jesus Christ, the great high priest, is beckoning on us. May God keep challenging us day and night. May we never give up. May we never throw the tower like many did in the time of the author of the book of Hebrews. May, may we keep our eyes on the prize. As we tell us when we get to chapter 12, keep your eyes on, keep your eyes locked on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Keep your eyes on him. Don't let circumstances cut off this plan so that when you arrive in heaven, I don't want you to arrive with, with your hands on the head. As, as John said it, that many people at that day will put their hands on their head. In other words, they will, be, they will shrink to shame having missed this great opportunity. It's a tremendous opportunity God has given us. May we continue to persevere no matter what is going on, no matter what is happening. There's great reward. That's why Paul, in writing to the Corinthians in chapter 15, verse 58, he tells them, be steadfast, immovable. Don't let anything move you. Don't let the circumstances move you. Don't let your world, don't let anything in this life move you. Lack of what? Don't let those things move you. Don't let your friends move you. Don't let success even move you. Be movable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Always abounding. Not today and then you, tomorrow you're gone. Always steadfast. Abounding in the work of the Lord. And he tells them, we know, knowing that the work of the Lord, knowing that the work you are doing is not in vain. Jesus said, I'm coming back and my reward is with me. Father God, thank you so much that you can teach us your truth. Thank you for the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you, Father, because you have a plan that cannot be altered. Thank you because you have a plan that you have put in place. Thank you that you have made us a link in this plan. Thank you because you have designed it so that we can be part of this plan that you have put in, that you have put in place. Holy Father, thank you for this wonderful group that tune in from all over, those who tune in from overseas, those who tune in from America, those who set aside what they could have been doing this evening. Some perhaps set aside watching game, football, or doing, or just going somewhere. They hurriedly tune in to study your work. Bless them immensely. May this truth enrich our hearts. Tonight, tomorrow morning, every day until Jesus returns. Keep our hearts burning like fire for your kingdom. Keep us growing in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Keep this coronavirus away from us. 
and those who have contracted it. Speedy recovery is my prayer. Help us, O oh God, that we may continue to grow in, our, in, in the grace of your son. We want to get to know you. As you say to us, draw near to God and he will draw near to us. Cause us to draw near to you through the study, studying and applying of your truth. That indeed you may draw near to us. That we may be instruments in great revival and great awakening that will struck this world. This is my prayer. As we go to bed, grant that we will have good night rest. Wake us up refreshed and grant us another day of grace that we may continue to do your work. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. <laughs>